Okay, first of all, there's a very important checkpoint called the start for the yeast. This checkpoint is to, for the cell to decide, should I go through the process of division or not? This is very important, why? Because I have to make the decision to make sure I have enough resources to replicate my genome, to divide, you know, we all, all, all of our cells are from one a fertilized egg, a big stem cell, right? When they divide and, and divide and divide, they commit into different cell fate. So each cell type is actually fate. And then that's also a fate decision when you become a skin cell, when you become a neuron cell. Yes. And all the cells have one genome but different fates. Actually, each cell fate is like a bunch of genes they win. Their muscle and their neuron, heart. And stem cell is like nobody yet are dominating. We can use mathematics to understand how and why a stem cell can become another cell fate and another cell fate can become a stem, stem cell. But I believe there will be new math, for example, new Whoa. mathematics simply by studying the life phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. So like cellular decision making will make will be new math that we uncover. For example, all, how we think, how the brain, how the brain uh, mm. uh, function. Mm. And how do we describe life? What's the mathematical language? What's the logic? Ni hao everybody, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakyan. We are on site in the beautiful Beijing, China at Peking University. We are now going to be talking about quantitative biology. We have Dr. Chao Tang joining us on the show. Hi Chao. Nice meeting you. Thank you so much for coming on our program, really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. You are super welcome. And such a fascinating person. Check out this bio, everyone, for those that don't know. Dr. Chao Tung is the co-discoverer of self-organized criticality and the Sampio model, which are revolutionary breakthroughs in understanding how complexity arises in nature. He's currently chair professor of physics and systems biology at Peking University, founding director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Quantitative Biology at Peking University, founding co-editor-in-chief of the journal Quantitative Biology, fellow of the American Physical Society, as well as principal investigator of the Tong Lab, which has 20 to 30 undergraduate and graduate students studying quantitative biological systems. And you can find the links in the bio below to the Tong Lab, as well as the Center for Quantitative Biology and the Wikipedia page. All right, Chao, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions that we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Uh, I am optimistic. I think science and technology will take us very far. Uh, I think that that's the main driving force for our world. Uh, many things will change. Uh, including maybe the definition of what is life and our ethics, uh, etc. But I'm excited. I think uh, the world will evolve to a more and more wonderful place for us to explore and to enjoy. Yes. What would you say is a key principle that we can embody and pass along to the next generations that will help ensure that we have a prosperous world? First of all, we have to be peaceful, uh, the most important. Uh, the world is really one world. Uh, we have just one village. Uh, I hope everybody realizes that, uh, so we can work together uh, to have a global view, uh, to have everyone educated, uh, to leave the pow poverty, and then go from there. Yeah. Peace. Peace, unity. Yeah. Uh, uh, no poverty and uh, education. Education, yeah. 
and disease and all this, they will, I think they will be, eventually will be solved, all these problems. Yeah. Yeah. And I especially love interviewing leaders that have been pushing the edge of science and technology forward for such a long time because the advancements that are found at the edge of science and technology at the edge of civilization's knowledge about fields are typically what ends up eradicating poverty, increasing education, increasing health, eradicating disease. Uh, these are the big things that enable people to live healthier, more creative lives. And peace and unity is, again, just one globe that we have to share that everyone has lived on before us that built this beautiful world. Did you know that the number of people that lived and died before us is approximated to be about 100 billion people? Hmm. No, I didn't know. The, Interesting. I, I, I love that statistic. It's one where I always try and like get behind the eyes of the different people that helped build society over hmm. the big time. It depends on where you define uh, when we start to be people. Right? Yeah, I think <laughs> I believe the estimates are like six million years ago okay. or so, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, it's always also interesting seeing if you can, you know, power laws very well. And mm -hmm. if you apply Pareto, the power law here, mm -hmm. you can hypothesize that maybe just 20 billion of the people made 80% of civilization's advancements. Mm -hmm. And that's always interesting. Well, who are those people and how did they think and what did they build? I love asking stuff like that. Let's talk about your journey. So born in the Jiangxi. Jiangxi province. That's right. Okay. And who were you as a kid and how did you get interested in science? Okay, so my uh, childhood was kind of interesting. I uh, grew up uh, during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, so essentially starting from the second or third grade of elementary school, the, uh, the Cultural Revolution started and then there's no formal education for many years. Uh, so we just uh, play and uh, uh, find whatever interesting books we can read. Uh, well, there weren't much books you can find at that time. So there are few books left on, uh, on the shelves of uh, my home are science books. It's, uh, if I translate into English, it's like 10,000 whys. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like a great book, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and, and the, uh, one of the books uh, is, uh, is about physics questions. Uh, I think that's one of the main reasons I got into, I got interested in physics. Plus, I had excellent physics teacher in middle school. Yeah. Wh what? Okay, this book is great. Yeah, the 10,000 wise, <laughs> I love stuff like that. There are many volumes for this book, but the, uh, yes. the few volumes left on the shelf, one is the physics volume. <laughs> yeah, the physics volume with the 10,000 physics wise. And because questions is our, is our way to probe reality and ask great questions it gives you a better quality of life and not being shy and just asking the great questions are so important. Okay, what about for those that don't know, I don't know, what was this like? What do you mean by, like, during the Cultural Revolution, what happened with school? Like, there was no teachers uh, in school? Well, uh, during a long period of time, maybe a year or two, the school simply was shut down. There were no classes. And then uh, the class resumed, but the, uh, the stuff we learned are very, sort of, very elementary and simple uh, stuff. There's no serious. Uh, class uh, and uh, uh, for example there's only very simple uh, uh, mathematics and physics you don't learn anything like history biology literature uh, geography philosophy uh, so it's a very very narrow education with uh, a very thin piece of knowledge but a couple years later, when you were in middle school, you already had a great physics teacher, so it had to come back. Yeah, the, well, yeah, well, I had a great physics teacher, but the stuff he was teaching in the classroom wasn't that complicated either, but that's enough. He, uh, uh, he inspired me. He, uh, 
uh, so I got interested in physics. So in some sense, maybe it doesn't matter how much, uh, how many books you you read uh, during your childhood. It's something you got excited, and yeah. you, you you feel passionate. Yes, and that's an important. A step in empathy for so many people. What would it be like if we just had like a two-year just like absence of of school systems in general? And it shows in many ways like just the fragility of what can happen in a child's life and in a culture's lo pro progress. And I think that's very important to try and like get behind. It. Like, what would it be like? Good thing you found the the ten thousand physics wise and and this type of stuff. Okay, but then how about um, the pursuing of physics, and you went to university in mechanics, and this was at the USTC, University of Science and Technology of China. Correct. Okay, so take us down this path. Yeah, uh, the, uh, uh, after, after high school, uh, at that time, we, we were still during the, in the period of Cultural Revolution, so there was no normal channel to go to college. Uh, but then, uh, two years later, the, uh, the, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping started his great reform. And one of the things he started is to uh, uh, open the college to, to, the, uh, to normal people, to, to a huge number of, uh, of, of young people, by edu through, uh, through uh, examination. And was it the Gaokao back then too? Gaokao, that's the first Gaokao. It was the first after year. After oh, the Cultural Revolution. What year was that first Gaokao? That's 77. 77. That's right. And prior to that, what was university for? Just how, could, how did people get into university before that? Well, well bef uh, before Cultural Revolution, there was Gaokao. Uh, it just stopped uh, for 10 years during Cultural Revolution. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, and, uh, and after Kao Kao was reinstalled, uh, I took Kao Kao and went to, call, uh, went to the University of Science and Technology of China. I wanted to study physics, but at that time, the, uh, our university, USTC, which was, I hope it still is, was the, uh, the best university uh, in China, the hardest university for young, for young people. They don't take physics students in our province because they think our province, maybe the educational level is not so high. Uh, so they only have quota for students uh, in the mechanics department. So I went to the department of modern mechanics. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I like physics, so I, I studied the physics. I went to physics class and uh, made physics friends. Uh, so I kept my interest in physics. Yeah, yeah. And mechanics and physics have so much in over, common, that's in right. common overlap. Yeah. So then, and this is a whole separate conversation. It would be so interesting to have someone uh, on the show that knows uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, cultural reform because there's so much nuance to it that I would love to eventually be able to um, interview someone on that exact subject. But this reopening of the universities was so important. And then you actually went on this cool program. It's Caspea. That's right. So during my uh, third year in college, I think, uh, and then we suddenly had this program. We heard about it. Uh, so the, uh, at that time, there was no normal channel for Chinese students to go to the U.S. to study. Uh, there was no GRE, no TOEFL exams, and the U.S. universities, they don't know how to admit Chinese students. Uh, there's no formal channel. But the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Nobel laureate, Professor T.T. Lee, uh, he saw this and uh, he, want, he wanted to start program uh, by himself. Okay, so he initiated this program, it's called China-U.S. Physics Examination and Application, 1980. Uh, so he contacted by his influence, he's a great physicist, he contacted U.S. Uh, physics departments of around 50 universities and get organized and then to uh, to administrate exams in China and then to select Chinese students to go to US okay so I I, I was uh, lucky uh, again the first uh, uh, first year uh, for this program uh, to start I, I called the wave uh, I took the exam and then ended up in the University of Chicago 
physics department to study uh, physics, to start my PhD uh, study. Wow, Th that program, you were t telling me before we started that it went on 10 years and then it stopped. And I love stuff like this. If we can inspire more programs like that around the world that do these great cultural and knowledge exchanges across the planet, we have a much greater propensity for that peace and that um, the harmony that we were talking about at the beginning. So, okay, so this program brought you to the University of Chicago where you did your PhD in physics. And tell us about the first like immersion into the United States. What was that feeling like? Uh, the culture, the people, the science, the university. What was that like? Well, well, it's a it's a, it's a big cultural shock, right? Uh, from every aspects, uh, the way professors uh, taught classes. Uh, uh, I, I had an American roommate. Uh, we get along fine, but then uh, we had also some uh, uh, frictions. Uh, it's, it's very different from, uh, from China, uh, how, how our roommates uh, get, get along with each other. But in the end, we both under understood each other. Uh, and uh, oh, one thing shocked me is that uh, I, uh, the first day I went to the physics department, uh, I got five or seven keys. Mm. So like I have lots of keys. <laughs> <laughs> Every door I need a key, right? <laughs> so mm, that's new. <laughs> yeah, many of, of these are uh, small cultural shocks. Yeah, but I enjoyed it really. I, I, I lived in the International House, uh, University of Chicago's International House, mm -hmm. uh, built by Rockefeller, I believe. And his initial, uh, University of Chicago was uh, 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 sponsored by Rockefeller initially. Uh, I think his initial belief is to build this international house is to uh, have people together from different cultures. Yes. And that really served uh, uh, me a lot. So I spent first two quarters, half a year, in the international house. Although the rent was very high, I basically, uh, all my... Uh, 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 salary I get by doing TA I was paying rent and uh, and food and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I made many friends uh, from different countries and different culture, uh, including many Taiwanese and Hong Kongese friends. Uh, so that was a great experience. Yeah. Very similar with my first immersion into China. Uh, I felt a very beautiful spirit that took me in warmly and the people and culture have just been the art and the it's just been so fun to be immersed in and I almost feel like uh, um, your I get to live through your first experience other people can hopefully live through my first experience so hopefully we can catalyze more of these first experiences around the world but how did you end up picking what in physics you wanted to do? It's such a broad field. There's so many different ways to tackle it. How did you pick what you wanted to do? I, uh, uh, I somehow got into uh, statistical physics uh, late in my college time. Uh, I think one of the reasons is that at that time, the, uh, there's a, uh, there was a Nobel a prize given to uh, Prigogine to award him in uh, in statistical physics in non equilibrium systems. So maybe that had impacted me, but also maybe of my interest to uh, uh, sort of daily life problems, like why sky is blue, why we have clouds, uh, 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 why waves in the ocean are white. Uh, so all this. Uh, the problems are very closely related to nature. Uh, and then uh, statistical physics is a tool to deal with all these matters uh, uh, of uh, the phases of matter, uh, uh, how many different parts, particles, molecules, put them together, how would they behave uh, in general, collectively, together. Like, if, like we have many individual individuals, we have all our own personality, but when we are together, we can do something together very differently. 
Uh, so in physics, it's very similar. We, if you have individual ingredients, they look very normal, nothing fancy. But if you put many of them together, the some phenomena emerge. So we call this emergent phenomena. Uh, like uh, superconductivity, uh, phase transitions, like water become uh, gas, become ice, they suddenly make something change drastically. Yeah, laser, uh, many, many examples. The analogy to humans is, is very important here because it's one that's super relatable for, for us that we as an individual have our own personality behaviors, but then when you add a second person, is a person, your mom or your dad, someone very close to you, is a person, maybe someone you've never met before, how does that change the dynamic? What about when you're in a group of a hundred or a thousand people? Exactly, yeah, the best example is our brain. Well, you know, if you just pick a single neuron, it's not so fancy, right? It's just some spikes, <laughs> some electricity, some spikes. You put them together and you get consciousness. You get consciousness, <laughs> you get everything. Uh, we still don't understand. <laughs> but that's the best example of emergent phenomena. Yeah. More is different. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, and the, that quote goes, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Absolutely. And that's emergent phenomena. That that's occurs. right. And this is interesting that the phenomena is evident at like you were describing this molecular or neuronal cellular mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. and it's also evident at a civilizational level absolutely society level mm -hmm. yeah the society is the uh, collective behavior it's emergent phenomena yeah there are many individuals that together then we have the society with this hierarchies of society yes. we have countries we have uh, economies and governments e corporations exactly and we have monetary system. Yeah. We have, have stocks, <laughs> stock markets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something completely imaginary. <laughs> yeah, this, the, the, the phenomenon of the civilization has in incredibly interesting creations that emerge from it um, that if we were just the eight billion nodes separate wouldn't necessarily emerge. So interesting. Okay, so I see how the worldview starts building out. So now Brookhaven National Lab, this is where the postdoc happened, and this is also where the Sam Pio model and self-organized criticality happened. So these are massive discoveries. Walk us through your time at the National Lab and how these things emerged. Yeah, uh, so this is actually related to my interest in collective behavior, where many individuals, that when they interact together, in physics at that time. Uh, so in graduate school, I, uh, by some chance, I learned there's a, uh, a phenomena called one of f noise. It's a very rich phenomena. Uh, it's a little technical, but uh, basically uh, many things like uh, the twinkle of the star, like the fluctuation of stock market, like the uh, uh, flow of, uh, of river Nile, Nile uh, they all fluctuating in time, right? Fast and slow and bright and dim, stock market up and down. And if you ask, what's the time scale fluctuation? Seconds or hours or days? Like stock markets, are they in seconds? Or hours or days or months or even years? And then people found that the fluctuations in all time scales. They are very fast fluctuations, and they are slow fluctuations, and they are slower fluctuations. They are all superimposed onto each other. So this is a very fascinating example of scale invariance. So a phenomena where you don't have a typical scale in time. Okay, and then also you have this phenomena. You have scale invariance in space and in energy. For example, in earthquake. We hear about big earthquakes. We hear much less about huge earthquakes. Well, in fact, there are many, many more small earthquakes. You don't hear about it because it's not uh, newsworthy. If you record all these earthquakes, small, medium, and big, and then ask 
how powerful they are. They fit a power law perfectly. Okay? There are many, many small earthquakes, and some in medium, me medium earthquakes, few big ones, very, very rare, huge ones. Again, there's no typical scale. There's no earthquake say, okay, most earthquakes are three Richter scale or five Richter scale. No. From one Richter scale to 10 Richter scale, even larger. They all exist. It's just a frequency uh, uh, decays as power law. So that's another example of scale invariance. And we also have uh, uh, examples of, uh, of uh, landscape and sea line. If you use a stick to measure it, then you will find out that there are large wanderings and small meanderings and even smaller little uh, uh, fluctuations in space. Again, there's no scale. So all these phenomena exist in nature. What's the mechanism? So in, Gra in grad school, I was interested in one wave noise, the scale invariance in time. During my postdoc, uh, I had a very, very uh, 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 free time. Uh, my supervisor, Prabhak, he is very, very uh, uh, liberal. So essentially, whatever I do, interesting, that's fine. So I can think about all these things. And then eventually we collaborated because we think this is wonderful, wonderful thing. We, and then uh, with another postdoc, Kurt Wiesenfeld, uh, we uh, uh, realized that all these phenomena possibly can be explained by a simple concept we call self-organized criticality. And by criticality, it means that things on the verge of break, it's critical. Okay, and by breaking continuously, you can generate all these fluctuations in space and time without a typical scale. The example can be illustrated by sandpile. That's why we use the sandpile model to uh, to illustrate it. So imagine in a beach, you build up sandpile by adding sand. Okay, originally the pile was flat, and there's no little uh, avalanches only small ones. As the pile gets steeper and steeper, you add more and more sand, sometimes you see larger, larger avalanches. And then eventually, they reach a critical point where the sand pile will not get more steeper. It will just fluctuate around the critical angle of repose. Right? But the fluctuation can be very interesting. You can have small avalanches, large avalanches, or some avalanches size in between. So that's a scale invariance. So this, this scale invariance, the system, is self-organized. You don't have to carefully change anything, like a temperature or something. You just drive it by adding sand, slowly. You drive the system towards some instability. And the system will stay at this verge of instability. Okay. If you drive it too much, you have instability, there will be avalanche happening, they will return to a more stable uh, state. So it's continuously fluctuating or stay at a critical point. So that's the name, self-organized criticality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what a fascinating discovery when we're in such a relatable example where so many of us are children and we put the the, the sand and sand and sand, and then we notice that one m more clump of, of sand can sometimes do nothing, just add to it, or sometimes the little clump or even just a little grain can cause a big avalanche, and then it goes back to stability. And the, the applications of this uh, sort of understanding are so interesting when we're talking about what is like what does the these this inner life of the cell that is smart enough to basically have some sort of an understanding of what's happening inside the cell what's happening in the environment outside the cell so like almost keeping like a ledger of what's happening inside the cell what's happening outside of the cell and then it gets to some sort of a point of in a sense maybe the amount of the amount of proteins continue increasing in the cell, and then at some point the cell goes safe to divide, and then cell divides. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a, I would say that's a 
different kinds of complexity. It's, uh, it's also a complex uh, phenomena. Life is the most fascinating complex phenomena. Uh, the self-organized criticality, uh, it's a, it's a uh, compared with life, it's a simple complexity, let's say. Although, <laughs> although recently people found that within, uh, 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 within life, there are also uh, phenomena like self-organized criticality, like our brain activity. They are brain avalanches. Brain avalanches. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, neurons. They fire together. As soon as you say, when I go back to the United States and someone says, Alan, how was China? <laughs> Associative web goes crazy. So many cruel experiences that I want to now share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it may have something to do with uh, information processing. Uh, but uh, life, on the other hand, offered us many, many different kinds of complexity. A cell is one example, right? A cell looks very, you know, innocent, uh, but it's very complex, in fact. It has to face all kinds of difficult decisions to make. Uh, for example, a single cell organism, bacteria or yeast, it, it has to decide when to divide, when to preserve its energy, yes. yeah. And it has uh, ways to measure the environmental information and somehow integrate the information to help it to make decision. So cellular decision making. So that's very fascinating. And also I study cell cycle. The life is actually very robust. Uh, imagine that all of us are product of a fertilized egg. Mm -hmm. That's a single cell. Mm -hmm. Divide, 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 divide. Tens of trillions of yeah. cells. Yeah. And then uh, not only this, they have all kinds of different, several hundred different cell types. Mm. How right. did they know to make how your they, nose? Yeah, how <laughs> do they know? And how do they, uh, how do they not to make a mistake yes. when divide, to copy DNA? Not put the three ear. Billion, three billion base the pairs to yeah. copy the DNA. Yeah. Uh, how, how do they make sure that it's a, uh, 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 the DNA has no mistake, it's time to divide and to grab the chromosome pairs, sister chromatids, to divide equally into two cells. And all this uh, we call robustness, biological robustness. So later on I was interested in complexity in biology. Uh, the first uh, uh, problem I worked on was protein folding, was on proteins. Proteins are also very fascinating. Amino acid sequence fold into three-dimensional structure very precisely. Yeah. A unique sequence fold on unique structure. Yes. No mm -hmm. mistake. Occasional mistake. Right? Occasional mistake. Yes. Yeah. And even the sequence has some mutations. In many cases, it was also fold into the same structure. So this is called robustness. Okay. And the structure itself is very robust. Is the uh, lowest free energy state, meaning that any other fold way of folding it, the energy is higher, thermodynamically. Uh, so I, I studied, I asked why proteins are so robust, yeah, from a statistical physics point of view. Yes. Uh, then, you know, I was fascinated. Uh, we found something also very interesting we call designability. This is because the protein structures are highly designable the way they wind around, the folded to each other. Not all the structures uh, can be made protein structures, or only sodium structures. They are so stable so that the many sequences can fold them and make them the lowest energy state. Okay, so this is a, this is a designability concept. <coughs> and then later on we move to study uh, the cell, the, uh, the network cell cycle network, for example. You can ask a similar question, why they are so robust? Why, they don't, why don't they make mistakes? You know, in the cell, it's very crowded. There are many cr proteins. They bump into each other. They don't have eyes. They just diffuse. And then if we are friends, we just stay a little bit longer. And then we'll be uh, 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 hit by other proteins or water, uh, uh, the thermal motion. We will be departed away. So it's all this kind of uh, uh, very noisy environment, crowd environment in cell, 
on the other hand, they can perform all these very precise functions, like cell division. Yes. Right? And then you can ask why. Uh, and there we studied from uh, a mathematics point of view, uh, nonlinear dynamics. You can write down differential equations or Boolean logic network, like how one protein is talking to other proteins. Mm -hmm. And then you simulate the network, you found that the system is very robust. It has, for example, it has a huge attractor. No matter where you start, they will go to this very stable cellular state. Mm. And then the cell cycle path is also very robust. Even you make some mistakes, there are many noises, like thermal noise or the uh, fluctuations in protein numbers. But the dynamics, the relationship between these proteins will force you to converge into this superhighway, which will lead you for the cell division process. Yes, 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 yes. Interesting. You can map out protein dynamics and how they lead onto the superhighway towards. That's the thing. That's right. The you, can understand from, you can understand it from a mathematical point of view. From a mathematical point of view, the That's quantitative right. biology side of things. That's right. So this understanding of the source code of biology, mathematically mapped, most people say this is chaos theory. How can you possibly map it? What can it unlock for us as we do map it? What does it end up doing for us? So many incredible applications, which we'll talk about. You've started to unpack. I want us to visit this on the way. You mentioned this. It's just such an important understanding of our world. Scale invariance, mm -hmm. 1 over F noise. noise. Power laws. Mm -hmm. So, when I look at something like earthquake magnitudes, you gave us this example, and they're all over nature, all over nature. Correct. So, in the rainforest, very similarly. 20% of the trees sequester 80% of the carbon and then they do cool things like sequester it and, and distribute it amongst its root networks to other trees that don't get as much carbon. Where humans, we can maybe learn a couple of things from that style of distribution of excess. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some analogies there that I've been writing and uh, speaking about a little bit. But, okay, there's that one. There's so many of these examples. Okay. Uh, then all of a sudden we see ourselves as well in the way that we also have acquired resources. 20% of the people have 80% of the wealth. Could maybe also be 20% of the people have 80% of the overall spiritual enlightenment, let's say. There's so many ways to view it. 20% of people own 80% of the land, all this type of stuff. So humans aren't actually separate from nature in the power law distribution. But okay, let's look well, at well, hum yes. humans are part of nature. We aren't. Yes, <laughs> we are not separate. Yeah. We are right. immersed right in it. And, and also, by the way, they, they, uh, I, I don't think all the power laws they have a unique mechanism. There can be different mechanisms for different power laws. Uh, different power laws for for power laws of different systems, for example. Okay. So maybe why twenty percent of pe people occupying eighty percent of the resources. It's not self-organized criticality. It's something else. What would you hypothesize it is? I don't know. Maybe it's a, some, some economic system, the, 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 the way uh, how the economy is running. And the rules and regulations that are maybe reshaped in favor of those that have accumulated more. It, it's, it's interesting. The, uh, in a way, I think I believe the society has been trying to optimize the efficiency Right, economic efficiency. Yes. Uh, maybe there's some already made model. I don't know. Uh, one can ask if I make a model, 
of uh, economics, of productivity, yes. if I optimize efficiency, is that outcome? Is the m most efficient uh, uh, eco e economics is like this or not? I don't know. That's an interesting question. I had a message that I started communicating to leaders in my network. I started asking them, okay. is there a center for economic simulation yet? Can uh, we, there are. There are. Yeah. I'm curious how robustly they've tagged all of the variables that mm -hmm. happen in an economy yeah. and then can do things like deploy in a code mm -hmm. to the economic mm -hmm. simulation, literally a digital twin of the Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. Let's take the US economy, for mm -hmm. example, and then you deploy an update, let's say the proposed uh, basic income. Yeah. Okay, $1,000 a month to people, deploy it, and then mm -hmm. run, see what happens in that simulation. Same thing with, well, what if we put a half a percent tax on all Wall Street transactions? Mm -hmm. Same thing, see, deploy it, see what happens in the simulation. I'm very interested in that. I'm also interested, and you can explain this if I get this wrong. When you look at, let's take a one over F noise and scale invariance again. So when you take a, 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 a wavelength mm -hmm. and you, uh, you zoom in mm -hmm. on the wavelength, mm -hmm. you see the same thing, mm -hmm. same repeating form mm -hmm. as when you zoom out, zoom out, Correct. zoom out, zoom out. This is, Correct. and you see this. You see the same form. Although the, uh, you may see different amplitude, okay, but you do the say see very similar form. There's a dis power distribution of different uh, wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Coming back to the... Uh, and this we see this in, in fractals too. We see this in fractals I too. I love the fractal. Yeah. <laughs> it's just you, you keep see, going. Yeah, you see all the same thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah yes. I, I can't help, but coming back to the yes. economics problem, yes, yes. <laughs> let's say, okay. you know, you may argue that, or one may argue that optimize productivity may not be our purpose. Maybe we want to optimize happiness of everyone. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how to balance it? Yes. Uh, this is a whole uh, open question. Yes. Uh, yeah. But your question is very interesting. What principles made this 80-20? distribution yes yeah. could it have literally been in the initial source code of when the Big Bang happened that nature <laughs> that nature evolves this way I don't believe it okay no. just tell us why yeah I I think uh, yeah I think Big Bang certainly created the uh, the universe uh, and uh, we are part of it uh, after we have planets, we have the solar system, and then life evolved. And there are many accidents along the way of evolution. I don't think there's a you know, fixed desti destiny starting from the Big Bang. It's just too many fluctuations and noise and uncertainties, uh, even from classical mechanics, let alone the quantum mechanics, uh, mm -hmm. the intrinsic uncertainties. So we are actually many, a product of many accidents. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there are some... Which could also be programmed in. <laughs> By programmed, I think, uh, if you mean to say, there's say, some general principles mm -hmm. that I believe there exist. Just like the amino acids accidentally misfolding when they fold into the protein. Yeah, why 20 amino acids, that's accident. Uh, and the asteroid why? colliding with the planet, accident, yeah, enabling why, humans to evolve. Yeah, but why protein structures this way? If we have 26 amino acids or 10 amino acids, I think the protein structures are reasonably robust. If life evolved in Mars and compared with us, I think that many details will be different. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. But many principles will be the same. For example, the distance from the star is a big one, of course. Uh, There's yeah, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the, if you want to fly, you have to uh, obey uh, hydrodynamics. Uh, you have to have winds. And if you to want to swim, you have to have this uh, shape. And we have two eyes because we can see the distance. Too many eyes are too, compl too complicated. And there are certain principles emerge, universal principles. 
And, and in fact, I'm really interested in, at this point, to look inside the complexity of bio biological complexity and trying to find principles, universal principles. Let's start talking about those. And, and this actually um, came after, I mean, we, there's just so many other incredible things that you did along the way. Spent time at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara, who worked at uh, Nippon Electronics Corporation, which actually Nippon is how you were teaching me, that's how Japanese reference Japan as Nippon. Right, Nippon. Nippon is Japan. And Correct. then the, was it like the US or the UK were just like, Let's call it Japan. <laughs> and the whole world just started calling it Japan? Versus, and so just Japan calls Japan Nippon, but all the rest of the world calls it Japan? This is, this is crazy. So it's, you, it's like, they used to call us Peking, right? In fact, we call ourselves Beijing. Very similar. Why are you call it Peking? <laughs> it, the, which was the old name? Yeah, it's old. It's, it's old. What, by old, meaning that some old British, he or she decided we call it Peking, right? According to some rule, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And you were with uh, NEC for 14 years. 13 and a half, to 13 be exact. And a half. Yeah. <laughs> You're like 13.5. <laughs> um, and also during that time, you pursued your interest in biology, and this totally makes sense with biology and physics being smashed together, um, elected as a fellow at the American Physical Society, um, and then you were going back to China every year during the summer, and this was for conferences, giving seminars, teaching, and that's when you started the Center for Quantitative Biology, then you were a professor of biophysics at UCSF for six years, and then you came back to uh, Peking University to chair the professor of physics and systems biology, and being the principal investigator at the Tong Lab now. So now let's talk about how you got, you plus the 20, 30 undergraduate and graduate students are studying quantitative biological systems, and you're finding these biological principles, how, First, out of everything in biology and physics, do you guys decide where to try and identify biological principles and quantitatively <laughs> pick? How do you pick what to study? <laughs> That's a question uh, every undergraduate student, and to some extent, every graduate student will ask, how do you pick problems, right? I don't think there's an answer for that. Uh, there's no standard answer. It's a, it's, it's a, it's part of science, right? It's uh, what, what problems are interesting? Uh, what do you see after problem? When you solve it, is that meaningful? Will that have an impact scientifically or technologically? I say, I think it's all personal choice in a way. So that's why science is fascinating. There's no common recipe to do science. But every scientist, for various reasons, historical training, interest, they have their own way to pick up problems. And eventually, they get, they learn this also. Uh, you may get lost. And some of my students, they got lost in the first few years, how to look for problems. Uh, but eventually you learn, and uh, it gets better and better. Uh, it's like uh, 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 Fermi, Enrico Fermi said, for a physicist, we have the sixth sense, okay? We have a smell, what is good science. In a way, the education for students is really, this is the most important thing. You have to learn taste of science to pick good problems. Okay, so that's a sort of general answer. <laughs> In practice, I let my students to pick their own problems. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, I just try to cre create an environment for them. An Evi environment of uh, bringing interesting problems, an open discussion, uh, and then they try to find their own problems. I think it worked. It <laughs> yeah. 
So okay, so so to most to be more specific, we don't pick problems because we are interested in a specific system or a particular protein or a particular disease or a particular pathway. So we don't pick problems and say, okay, we want to conquer cancer. Then we try to see what is the problem I can study to conquer cancer. And that's not our way of picking problems in our, in our, our lab. So we pick a problem we think it's interesting scientifically because by investigating it, by solving it, you will gain a broader, general, hopefully universal knowledge. Uh, it's, a, it's more like curiosity driven. So to give you an example, so why people study magnetism and electricity? hundreds or even thousands of years ago. I don't think they realize we can have lights. We study electricity, then we can have lights. It's very purposeful. I don't think they realize that electricity and the magnetism are two parts of the same coin, two, si two sides of the same coin, and Maxwell unified it, and then we have electromagnetic wave, mm -hmm. then we have wireless communication. Mm. We have all these huge applications. Nobody knows. They're just out of curiosity. Okay, what is electricity? What is magnetism? Oh, electricity can generate magnetism. Magnetism can induce electricity. What are the rules? What are the laws? What are the equations? Can you unify them? So that's how the most fundamental science advanced. This is electromagnetism, quantum mechanics, very similar. Not very purposeful to solve in a particular problem, but out of curiosity, I want to understand. Okay. And then the, the, the way we pick up biological problems, we want to understand. In a way, of physicist point of view, understanding. And we want to use quantitative ways to understand. We want to have equations. We want to ex extract principles. So that's a general way of picking problems. Yes. So my lab is, if you look at my lab, they study all kinds of different things, unrelated. Yes. But the really there's a general theme behind. We're going to dive deeper into this style of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary thinking, which is very embedded in your life with the study of physics and then biology and how those merged. And let's go into, um, okay, as you are describing this, it comes up to me that a lab, in a sense, could say, hmm, let's apply a power law style of understanding where we could potentially invest our resources. So can we find the 20% of quantitative biology that's going to give us 80% of the knowledge of how quantitative biology actually works? Okay, so if you take it from that angle, maybe you have like a think tank hap constantly happening at your lab where they're constantly thinking what are the key scientific drivers of quantitative biology and then how do we conduct experiments to understand those keys that can then go off into the world and then inspire other scientists and labs to keep driving the understanding forward. So it came up and then but I also realized that the way that you talk about it inevitably leads to when you let the students pick and explore it inevitably also leads to that where you have a couple of the kids that are doing these core um, competencies of quantitative biology and then other ones that are maybe doing like more like something to deal with like an orphan style problem let's say where it's only impacting a smaller percentage of people but those people are obviously need science driven towards solving that style of a problem like an orphan disease or whatnot okay now Let's break this down. So you gave us uh, a couple of these source codes that you're aiming to 
drive our understanding towards solving complex diseases, designing new therapeutic strategies, but you got to know how the cell makes decisions and you call this um, cell cycle regulation. Mm -hmm. What is, how is the cell making decisions? Does it keep, like we were talking about, does it keep a ledger of what's happening <laughs> within the cell? And excellent, excellent. Question. What's happening outside of the cell? Do I have a ledger <laughs> of both? In fact, uh, 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 one of the work uh, uh, which was just accepted uh, was exactly what you said. There's a ledger. The cell has a memory about the past environmental condition and use that memory to decide to make decisions for the current. Okay, so the you know, for, for example, for the single cell organism, budding yeast, the organism we use to make beer, bread, budding yeast, our friend, it's a model organism. Uh, so we use that to study uh, cellular decision, cell cycle regulation. Uh, so we found that the cell integrate the past condition to make help to, to help make the current decision how they do that okay first of all there's a very important checkpoint called a start for the yeast this checkpoint is to for the cell to decide should i go through the process of division or not this is very important why because i have to make the decision to make sure I have enough resources to replicate my genome, to divide, okay. On the other hand, you can't wait too long because what if your competitor, they make smarter decision, they divide faster than you, then you're outcompeted. So this is a optimal uh, decision. How you use environmental information how you know that now is the right time to go through the division process? Yes. Wait, but not too long. Mm. This is a cellular decision. Mm -hmm. Kind of like we wait, but not too long. I yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, kind you, of like you, marriage you, for us. Exactly. <laughs> is that where you were you going? Can't, you can't afford to wait forever. <laughs> you can't, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like marriage, then you will be, uh, you can't you find nobody. You can't wait until yeah. 50 or 60. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Same for the cell. And so through the billions of years of evolution, they became very smart to make the decision. So this is a crucial checkpoint, very critical checkpoint. And what, them, what makes them to pass this checkpoint to make the commitment of division is to take all this environmental information, like what's the nutrient condition around me, how big I am, you know, how much storage I have, for the food, for, 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 for resources, and all this. And people know this, and they study it. Although it's not completely clear, but people know that they, they use and integrate the current information. So what we recently discovered is that they even use the past information. So cell current ledger, but also cell memory. Exactly. So they remember the past cycle from the last division to up to now, to current, how long I experienced. The longer the journey I experienced, which means the condition is worse because you grow slower, everything's slower, it takes you longer to reach the current status. The shorter the journey means that the other conditions are good, so you grow fast, you you copy DNA faster, you divide faster, you, 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 you are at this current status. So this longer or shorter is the best sort of uh, characteristic of past condition. So that remember this length of past journey by a concentration of a protein. The longer the journey, the higher concentration of this protein. The shorter the journey, the lower concentration of this protein. And this protein happened to be the gatekeeper of this checkpoint. So the past journey is long, 
which means the past condition has been tough. Just building high concentration will be high. So the bar to pass this checkpoint is high. Mm -hmm. So the cell has to grow longer or to get more signals. The current conditions are really good to pass it. What an incredible way to understand Smart. cell memory. <laughs> what an incredible way. Harder journey for the cell. To be more careful now. To be more careful, which means, okay, our protein threshold yes. is higher exactly. before we decide to take the next division. That's right. And if it was easy, protein threshold is lower. Correct. And then, okay, you don't have to be so careful. You can just... Pass, but you still have to integrate current information, but the bar is lower. You can use microscopy to see how many proteins are in the cell. Correct. We can, yeah, we can quantify it. Yes. And your uh, quantification methods right now use which tools? We, we, we label the protein with fluores fluorescence uh, protein. Uh, we fuse the protein with, our, with GFP, green fluorescence protein, and then you can see it under the microscope. The brighter, which means more uh, protein, higher concentration, so we can quantify it. And how do you add the GFP? Oh, that's genetics. That, that's, that's easy. Thanks for the revolution for molecular biology. You can fuse the gene of GFP uh, to the gene of this protein in the genome. You can insert. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, you're inserting the GFP gene into the first cell of yeast or which just one cell of yeast and yep. all the daughters all the, all the, yes. all the, all the all yes yeah okay all the generations will have this gene okay yes into the first cell of yeast and then you then take as it proliferates whether it's slow proliferation or fast proliferation that's right you take and sequence those and then you see no, that we don't have yeah. to sequence that okay. we just we just under the microscope we can see, see how the fluorescence the, yeah the fluorescence okay and then we can grow the uh, yeast under different conditions good condition bad condition stressed condition we add salt so that you know you can change all kinds of conditions for the past experience and to see the accumulation of this protein yes yes okay mm -hmm. okay Okay, so that is, is that our first understanding of cell memory? Like in, like uh, no, I wouldn't yeah. say the first understanding, but this is the first understanding how cell use memory to regulate this checkpoint, the cell, the cell cycle. Okay. The start checkpoint. This is, oh, you call it the start yeah. checkpoint. S-T-A-R-T? That's right. Okay. It, it, not me call it, uh, uh, Lee Hardware called it. He discovered this checkpoint and got a Nobel Prize. Beautiful, yes. so beautiful. Okay, so now <clears throat> this is uh, one of the the um, cell uh, memory plus cell ledger coming together into this uh, cell cellular dynamics. And okay, so what are the other? Uh, this one's are obviously very important this protein threshold and shall I, is am I ready to divide? Okay, okay, this, this one is very obviously very important. Ha, have, what other ones have we uncovered? What other cellular dynamics like this? Uh, another example is that uh, stem cell reprogramming. You know, we all, all, all of our cells are from one a fertilized egg, a big stem cell, right? When they divide and and divide and divide the commit into different cell fate. So each cell type is actually fate. And then that's also a fate decision when you become a skin cell, when you become a neuron cell. Yeah. And all the cells have one genome but different fates. Okay. And now it's very uh, 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 scientifically and technologically very important to reverse the process, to take a muscle cell or skin cell to transfer it back to a stem cell. So from one cell fate to another cell fate. Well, there are many applications. You use the stem cell, can grow a heart, maybe a pancreas, for example, can have many medical uh, uh, applications. But we're interested in the science of it. How can cell change fates? Yes. Yeah. How and how? How do we, this is so crazy. Yeah, and the, uh, the uh, Many years ago, uh, 
scientists, including the Japanese scientist Yamanaka, they discovered, you maybe you remember the name, uh, uh, Yamanaka. Yamanaka. Yamanaka, yeah. Uh, they discovered that for a, a normal cell, a differential cell, when you add certain uh, genes, which are usually expressed in stem cell, you can transfer this normal cell into a stem cell. Mm -hmm. So by gene transfer, transformation, you add the gene, you express, you highly express the genes, which are normally expressed in the stem cell. Okay, for that he got the, he won the Nobel Prize. It's a very uh, 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 big discovery. But what's the, mech what's the uh, principle behind it? Can we use mathematics to model it? If we can model it, then we can, maybe we can understand more. We can, get, we can gain uh, deeper insights. Okay, and then we are very uh, lucky. We got interested in this problem simply because uh, uh, we have a wonderful colleague, Hong Kui Den, a professor in Peking University. So he studied stem cell. And they found something very interesting. They found that you don't have to use Yamanaka's recipe of the stem cell genes to induce stem cell. In fact, you can replace some stem cell genes with some other differentiated cell genes still induce stem cell. So this is very counterintuitive. Mm. Say, in order to, for a, for example, for a, for, for a uh, muscle cell to become a stem cell, mm. of course you want to, intuitively, you want to let the muscle cell express, even artificially, the stem cell genes. Mm. So then you have a hope, right? Mm. If I want to look like you, then I, want, I better to, to take, take a picture and make my eyes look like you, my, my, my nose look like you, and then maybe I can really be look like you. This is not a good idea. <laughs> better to look like you. <laughs> but they found that they can use some other genes. So it sounds like it really messed up the system. And then the cell became stem cell. So we started collaboration with them. We started to write down equations, mathematical equations, to describe the interactions of the genes. Mm -hmm. The genes interact. The stem cell genes, they promote each other, and then they have their favorite uh, 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 downstream genes to promote. But the downstream genes for different fates, they hate each other, and then they also, they don't like stem cell genes. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a relationship. So different genes, they have, they have a complicated relationship, and they fight. We can use quantitative biology and yes, ma mathematical can, methods correct. to take a stem cell and change it into whatever we want? Not whatever we want. We can use mathematics to understand how and why a stem cell can become another cell fate and another cell fate can become a stem, stem cell. So we can map out the, the cell lineage of something as complex as a human being from single cell becoming gestating inside of mom all the way to baby that's being born and then that evolving into not, an adult. Not, not, not the whole complexity. Not yet. Not yet, yeah. But for, for, uh, for certain special cases, okay, so certain differentiated cell, not all the differentiated cell, so maybe there are some we don't quite understand. But for those we, we understood, the genetic interactions, like what's the master gene for this differentiated cell, why they are muscle cell, why these are neuron cell, oh, because in the muscle cell, the genes are muscle one, so they then they repress all the other neuron-like genes, right? It and won. It won. It, it won. Right? You're, they, they fight interesting. and then okay. they won. They, they win. They win, right? And actually, each cell fate is like a bunch of genes. They win. They are muscle and they are neuron, heart, 
And stem cell is like nobody yet are dominating. Yeah. And all, only the stem cell genes are playing. We are dominating. Yeah. Okay. And then there are all kinds of signals, there are all kinds of ways for stem cell to be induced towards muscle yes. or neuron. Yes. And, but all this can be described in certain cases when we know enough about the relationship of these genes by mathematical equations. At some point, we go from the single cell to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, etc. And at some point, there becomes the, 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 the brain cells start to, the neurons start to win in mm -hmm. certain, mm -hmm. the heart cells mm -hmm. start to win, the That's muscle right. cells, the That's bone right. cells. That's right. You have all kinds of signals during the de development in, in space and time. So at a certain point, and this bunch of cells differentiate into specific cells, and another point, another space, these cells will develop into another fate. Correct. Yes. And that's called, uh, you guys call that cell fate or cell yeah. determination. Cell fate. Yeah. 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 Different cell types, different fate. That's, yeah. We, we call it cell fate because it's really a fate for a cell. It is, yeah. To become a neuron, it's a neuron forever. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's only artificially you can make the change, it's fate, but usually it doesn't change the fate. How is that not similar to if Alan is born in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 1992 to the specific parent, to the specific environmental status and socioeconomic status, that Alan will just over and over and over again have the same fate 80 years later. Uh, besides maybe that slight mutation every millions of iterations. For, 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 for all the cells in Alan, the fate are more or less fixed, right? Well, some... But Alan as a whole... Alan as a whole... Could get hit by a bus. That's a, that's a different fate, right? Okay. That, that's, a, that's many, many other environmental influences. Yes. Uh, deterministic or accidental, stochastic, right? Mm. So that's 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 different fate. Uh, for the cell fate, it's actually more deterministic. More deterministic. Yeah, it's very precise. And Alan is a little bit more open to free will, let's say, potentially. Uh, Versus when the cell, the sperm meets the egg, this is a pretty deterministic that you're going to get a baby in nine months that's pretty healthy. That's right. And also this, this, uh, this uh, fertilized egg will develop into a human being. Yes, yes. Or the hardwired. Yes. You know, and that's, that's pretty much deterministic. But also there are many things uh, that are accidental, especially later on the connection, the strength of the connection of our neurons is by learning, by experience. Yes. And then yes. people can be very different. Given if you were born in the exact same location with the exact same parents at the exact same environmental stimuli at the exact same time and you know blah 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 blah, that you would probably become who you are today again and again and if again. If everything is exact, yeah. Uh, I will become, I would say, of course we don't understand this at, the point, at this point. Okay, the whole scientific community, I don't think we completely understand this. I will become, I don't know, maybe 70% the same, I would say, 70, 80. There's still about 20, 30% uncertainty, variance. No, all, those, all those are purely due to cell, cell variability. Even everything is the same, the two cells can be different simply because all this process of a gene making a protein, it's stochastic. So to exact the same cell, one cell can make this protein more and that will be less. So this is stochasticity. And this can make a difference. A big difference. Can make a big difference. Down the line. Down yeah, the line. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so from the point of, of being one cell to being a baby nine months later, less variability than once you come out of the womb 
uh, into the world over 80 years more downstream variability potential. You gave it about 20 to 30 percent. Potentially, yeah. But even, even, even in the womb, when it develops, there's this kind of cell cell variability. Also about like the same percentage, you would say? Less. Less. Like identical twins, for example. Yeah, right? okay. Identical twins, when they're just born, that's an interesting, interesting question, how, how similar they are. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. how similar their brains are, the connectivity. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine there's still some variability. But not by a lot. But later on, they say, larger and larger influence. This uh, variability, by, but not by a lot, kind of reminds me of the hypothetical that there's another uh, Dr. Chow Tung orbiting another star <laughs> in another <laughs> parallel universe where he's slightly <laughs> different <laughs> than this one. And then there's another billion of those uh, parallel universes running different Dr. Chow Tungs all at the same time. And who knows what happens during dreams, if maybe during those eight hours that you go and visit those uh, parallel <laughs> Dr. Chow Tongs. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is all about, I love this, cellular decision making and understanding how simplicity evolves to complexity. Mm -hmm. And the more that we build tools that understand the source codes of the simplicity, the better we can understand over time and space how it evolves into complexity. What other tools do you and your lab want to build to understand the source code of the simplicity? Uh, well, no specific tools we really want to build. We mostly we use existing tools like microscope, uh, the GFP, uh, differential equations. Mm. And recently, artificial intelligence. Yeah, it teaches about this. Yeah. Uh, so we use the existing tools, and then we develop the tool. Usually, you have to to modify it to the mm -hmm. specific problems you are studying. Uh, and then, the uh, of course, we always keep our mind open to uh, to discover something brand new. So personally, I believe. Although I may not be, I'm sure I will not be the one to discover it. But I believe there will be new math, for example. New Whoa. mathematics. Simply by studying the life phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. So, like cellular decision making will, make, will be new math that we uncover. For example, all, how we think, how the brain, how the brain uh, mm. uh, function. Mm. And how do we describe life? What's the mathematical language? What's the logic? Yes. I don't know, but I feel that our current math is not quite there to describe the essence of life phenomena. So there will be new math coming, and I believe there will be new physics. Whoa. Okay, and all this physics we can explain quite well. Uh, many small things, elementary things, and also things are in equilibrium. Yeah. But life is a, as we said, is a very compli complicated emergent phenomena. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's an open system. We take energy, we learn, we take information. Uh, so what's the new physics? Yeah. So I believe we will have new math, new physics, or even new computer science. Our computer is completely different framework, architecture, then our brain. Yeah. How we do com computation is very different from computer. Yeah. If we know more, and more our, uh, know, know more and more about our brain, we can make better computers. We can be smarter. Yeah. Our machine can be smarter. Yeah. Yes. So now the uh, artificial intelligence, the uh, deep neuron network, very hot, right? Yeah. Be the uh, go champion, world champion. Yes. It just learned a little bit of brain structure, right? It can be very powerful. So it's going to be very exciting to have uh, this brain science and computer science coupled together. Uh, there'll be many new tools and new science. Yeah. 
At this point, we, uh, uh, we use deep neural network to try to understand the biological system, try to extract the genetic interaction. As I just described, all the genes, some are friends, some are enemies. They fight, they help each other, so it's very dynamic. When cell make decisions, it's very dynamic. When they, when they replicate, it's very dynamic. When, do, when they do metabolism, it's very dynamic. Okay. Uh, when they do cell phase transitions, transformation, very dynamic. So we, if we know more and more about these genetic interactions, we know more and more about the cell, about the cellular interactions, about the organism. But how do we know, how, you know, how can we speed up this? Traditionally, we do genetics, biochemistry, molecular biology, trying to figure out, you know, so-called low throughput, by low throughput experiments. So that's very powerful, it's very, very efficient. But now there are more and more tools to observe the cellular behavior. To see the gene expression, as I said, we can use a GFP to see the protein concentration go up and down with time. Well, we can see many protein concentrations go up and, up and down in the cell. So we have all this information. Can we use this information to guess, to infer the genetic interaction? Are there friends? Are there enemies? So we use neural network, artificial intelligence to, to do this. It's, it's been fun, yeah. Okay, so the lab has been identifying, and you have been identifying now over decades, the best tools for you to use with your own added ideas and added experimental uh, um, processes to be able to uh, un understand uh, quantitative biology better and better and so then when you add something like artificial intelligence um, and computational capacities that are evolving so rapidly to something like the chaos theory of biology it enables us to faster and faster get the quantitative biological source codes that we want to know you gave this example of like what I feel like is a theory of everything that will eventually emerge. You said probably not in your time, um, maybe in mine, who knows, but that can merge quantum mechanics, general relativity, those two, and then how that initial source code ends up creating complex biological phenomenon um, that evolve civilizations that then begin to poke at the source code that then potentially just make another cycle and of life. Well, okay, so the, the theory of everything is not the theory of everything in the usual sense by the physicists. And there they want to uh, unify uh, general relativity, gravity, and every, this, the, the basic forces of, of nature, right? I don't, I don't believe general relativity or special relativity is uh, relevant to life phenomena. Quantum mechanics, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I, I meant theory for life. It's a new theory. Maybe new mathematics. Okay. In fact, at every level of nature, at every scale, there can be a new theory. Mm. With elementary particles, with with quarks, yes. right? And then we have nucleus. We have nuclei. We have molecule. We have uh, uh, matter, we have you know, solid, liquids, gas, and then we have life, we have galaxy, we have universe, we have life. Yeah. And, and, and all these levels, they, all, they can all emerge. Very special theory. For example, in physics, the thermodynamics and statistical physics, it's emerged from many interactions of molecules and atoms. It's a new law. The phenomena you cannot observe in a single particle. Also, it doesn't help if you understand a single particle. You can understand the general behavior of water. You understand oxygen, you understand hydrogen. Even you understand a single water molecule, 
you still don't understand when you put many, many water molecules together, how they behave. Will it be the gas, or ice, or liquid? So that's a new level of, uh, of theory. And the science is trying to link all these levels. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but it doesn't mean that if you lo know the lowest level, you can derive, you can understand all the levels. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes you understand higher level first, and then you try to link to the lower level. Okay, sometimes you understand lower level and then yeah. push to the higher level. Yes. So it's going yeah. in between, back and forth. Mapping the source code that's in right. both directions. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And biology and the higher level maybe it's psychology, right? And then maybe society. All these molecules interacting, I have my personality. Yeah. I have psychology. Yeah. How do they how does psychology emerge from biology? Is the most complex thing in the universe a human civilization? I I believe not. What could what could be more complex than that then? I think brain can be more complex than that. But is the brain within uh, all eight billion of us together, isn't that civilization include the eight billion brains? See, you, you realize we have many historians and many great history books. They can describe the human civilization reasonably well, and they can even reason why they go from this step to that step, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, Industrial Revolution. There's no single theory yet to write a history book of our brain. Why we have consciousness? Yeah. How memory works? Yes. Why we can sit here and to talk talk to each other? Yes, yes. Okay. I don't know. It's just my feeling. The the rival to what's as complex as human civilization is hum the human brain. Mm hmm. See, I think the human civilization for us it seems to be easier to understand because we don't have to go from the brain level to understand it, mm -hmm. right? We just go from individual behavior. Like, okay, human, we need, we have to eat, we have to, uh, we have to live, and then they interact. There's some, something for them to optimize. Uh, they want the power, they fight. So you can, you can start from some higher level basic rules and assumptions and then to describe the emergence of human civilization, right? So that's why I said, sometimes you don't have to go down. You, you, you don't have to understand the brain. Mm -hmm. To assume some basic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ingredients. So what's the basic ingredient of human society, right? The food, the living yeah. resources. Air, water. Air, water. Yeah. And Shelter. Yeah, and then people fight for this, people collaborate for yeah. this, and yeah, and yeah. they organize to protect yeah, themselves. Yeah, yeah. Now this is kind of far. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, wow. Wow, yeah, so understanding source codes from civilization and human brain levels and the behavioral dynamics of the civilization, like psychology, and, neuro, and of course including yeah, neuroscience and the way that that emergent phenomenon works while simultaneously we go uh, and understand the initial moments of the Big Bang and we understand uh, uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity and uh, and and up we go to uh, atom to um, atoms and molecules and cells and 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 then yeah and then we meet and that together can unlock not only what gives us the better education, the better healthcare, the better technology, the better society, more happy people, more creative people, better world harmony, that as long as our ethics and our morals and our wisdom rises at the same time is very important. But it also enables us to do things like take that source code and then run our own evolutions, our own simulations and run quadrillions of them and just observe what happens. Just like in this case, you're running simulations of, of yeast and you're, we're running and watching how the cell 
has a fate of becoming a heart or becoming a brain. And the depth of, of, uh, of understanding the source code of quantum, of quantitative biology here um, is extremely applicable at all of the levels of understanding mm -hmm. the source code. Yeah, so, yeah, I think so. that's why I said in the beginning, I think science and technology are really the driving force for the society and for the human civilization. And uh, really, we have a very, very, very uh, open field for us to explore. And all kinds of opportunities. Uh, and of course, all this uh, ethics, uh, they have to uh, come up. Yeah. How about can you clone a human being? You know, when the uh, AI is also developed, how do you combine human and AI? To what extent you can combine them? Uh, there are all, all, all kinds of uh, uh, issues. Uh, but I think uh, I am uh, op optimistic. I think as science advances, technology advances, we'll face all these issues. But we are sort of advanced. That's very exciting. We so we have bright future. Yes, likewise, very optimistic. Um, I want to make sure that we talk about the importance of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary studies. Um, it's now become more and more clear that through our conversation, obviously, you took a very physics and biology and, and mathematical and computational now perspectives that are helping you with this, but also just me as an as someone that's interviewing people at all on all different fields are giving me a very strong world view that is making very interesting connections across disciplines you guys even at your lab in your center for quantitative biology you have to practice website design and, and marketing and selling and grant writing so you can get the newer equipment and you have to be good storytellers to inspire other people to care about quantitative biology and to be collaborators with you so if you can be a good artist and designer and storyteller while you're a good scientist and stuff, you really have a creative edge. And I want you to speak to why you care so much about interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary studies and how your students as well uh, practice that. Yeah, this is really a, uh, a mode of scientific research and the different modes you can stay in the, within the discipline and you can go across disciplines. I wouldn't say which is right, which is wrong, or which is better, which is worse. I think we need all of them. Yes. Uh, the trends in the last century or so is that the discipline has become more and more specific and the barrier between disciplines has become higher and higher. And in, in the last decade or, or two, maybe even longer, uh, scientists realize that we have to cross, we have to break these barriers. And in fact, if you see many new discoveries, new breakthroughs, they're really at the boundary of two or more disciplines. And if you also, if you ask some societal questions, like air pollution, like even cancer, okay, or how long can we live? All these are really not a single discipline problems. It's a problem of many disciplines. So you need perspective of, from dif different disciplines, you need people from different disciplines to work together. Uh, from educational point of view, I think at least some fraction of students, they have to be educated broad-minded, so that the, the discipline is not a war in front of them, yeah. so that they will not see a problem, ah, oh, this is a math problem, I can only solve the mathematical part of it, yeah. or this is a physics problem, or this is not a physics problem, so I don't know how to solve it. You just see this is a scientific problem, yeah. right? And then you just use whatever knowledge, whatever tools you can utilize. Right. So that and that that has to be 
uh, nurtured, educated from the very beginning. So that's why we have this all the interdisciplinary uh, uh, education program, undergraduate and graduate. And the science we do, quantitative biology, it's biology. The subject is biology. Quantitative meaning that we use other more quantitative disciplines to study it, right? It can be mathematics, can be physics, chemistry, or computer science. So that we can discover things. You, if you only studied from a uh, biology perspective, we cannot discover. We can discover new things. Yep. Yep. I really adore and just prioritize this style of thinking. We need them all, like you listed. We need people that are just going really hard in just math as well, of course. But to, and we kind of live, we both, we, we live in this world. We both do. You have Gaokao in China. You have ACT, SAT, all GPA, whatever, etc. inside the United States. And there's all different types of these tests. And they do a pretty good job at, at measuring IQ and measuring um, math and, and, and uh, reading skills and stuff like that. Okay. What about emotional intelligence? What about the emotional quotient? What about people skills? Empathy, growth mindset, perspective taking, emotional regulation, meditation, spirituality. What about stuff like that? And how can that, even a little bit of it at a young age, how can that drastically compound and make someone an even better scientist down the line? And same thing with maybe a little bit of music or a little bit of art. How can that make someone a drastically better scientist down the line? Yeah, I think uh, all those are very important. I, uh, I believe general education, uh, liberal, liberal arts education. So I think students are, it's very important for students to expose to all kinds of things. Now, later on, they can, special, they can be specialized. But at least in, the, uh, in college, at the college level, in high school level, or younger, they should be generalists to learn, to learn many things, to integrate many things, and find their own interest, their passion. Uh, yeah. I absolutely agree. We, we need all those you said. Yeah, including music and arts. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I have, mus I have musician friends. I have uh, mm -hmm. uh, artistic uh, artist friends. I, uh, I really like to, uh, to be with them. Yeah. yeah. Inspiring. Yes. Uh, right? I am a generalist. Oh. Woshi Tsai. Yeah, I am a polymath. I am a generalist. Wu Shi Tsong Tsai. Wu Shi Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I learned that one mm. while I was here mm. because mm -hmm. I thought it was so important. And the other one, Wu Shi Ji Ji. I'm a journalist. Mm. Yeah. Wu Shi Ji Ji. Oh. oh, you got it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm a yeah. journalist. I was teacher. That was mm. journalist, but yeah. Yeah, Wu Shi Tsong Tsai. I love. Wu Shi Tsong Tsai? Wu Shi Tsong Tsai. I'm a polymath. I'm a generalist. That's how I, that's how I learned it. There's uh, probably multiple ways. Chinese is so interesting and difficult. Um, but again, this idea that if you expose children at young ages to all different types of tools and methodologies of learning and then let them do things like, you're like, okay, here's the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Pick and try and tackle these problems. Project-based learning, tackling these problems. I don't necessarily know SAT, ACT, Gaokao, that type of stuff. Probably excellent in, in many ways. At the same time, project-based learning around solving the sustainable development goals, helping children explore being generalists and stuff like that. I'd also um, welcome that a little bit more in our world. What do you think is the meaning of life? 
<laughs> That's interesting. I, 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 everyone thought about it at a certain stage of his or her life, I believe. Yeah. Now I don't think it's so much, actually. I feel, it's, I feel fascinating that there's so much for us to understand, to contemplate, to explore. Nature, society, brain, and also all these possibilities uh, of science and technology. All these consequences, unimaginable, imaginable and unimaginable. It's, it's wide open. I'm just excited. What's the role of love in our world? I think it's important. Without love, we are too dry, I think. Then we become a machine. We can be very good, but then we lose a sense of community, a sense of us. Uh, we need love, the big love, to, uh, to share the globe, to share the earth, to be harmonious with each other, and to be happy with each other. So that's, I think, love is important ingredient. Love that. And what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Nature. Nature cre created everything. And we are trying to understand nature. Yeah. Wow, such a mind-blowing episode. Thank you, Chow. Thank you so, so much for coming on our show. It's, it's a pleasure. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about quantitative biology, about understanding the source code of our reality, about cellular dynamics, about everything that Chao is teaching us on the show. Have more conversations about that. Push the edge of what's known in our world. Check out the links in the bio below to the Tong Lab. Also check out the Center for Quantitative Biology as well here at Peking University. Go and come and visit Peking University. Come and visit the Center for Quantitative Biology. It's a beautiful campus. It's a gorgeous campus. I can't, Peking University and Tsinghua University are right next to each other. The funnel for brilliant people in the world is so strong here. It reminds me of the MIT Harvard right next to each other in Cambridge. It's very similar. I love that. And also check out the links to simulation in our in the bio below support us help support us you can find us on paypal patreon cryptocurrency you can design cool merch and get paid support the artists the entrepreneurs the organizations around the world that you believe in and go and build the future everyone manifest your dreams into the world thank you so much for tuning in we love you very much and we'll see you soon peace <laughs>